Good morning, everyone. Some people are still trickling in, but let's start. Uh, welcome to the keynote lecture of the wider development conference, the puzzle of peace towards inclusive development in fragile contexts. I'm pleased to introduce Sir Timothy Baisley, who will provide the keynote lecture of the conference. Tim Baisley is School Professor of Economics and Political Science, and the W. Arthur Lewis Professor of Economics and uh, of uh, Development Economics at the London School of Economics and Political Science. From September 2006 to August 2009, he served as an external member of the Bank of England's Monetary Policy Committee. Since 2015, he has been a member of the UK's National Infrastructure Commission. He's a fellow of the Economic Research Society, the British Academy, and the European Economic Association. He's also a foreign honorary member of the American Economic Association and the American Academy of Arts and Sciences. He's currently president of the Royal Economic Society and has served as president of the International Economic Association, the European Economic Association, the Economic Society, the most prestigious societies in economics. Professor Baisley is also past co-editor of the American Economic Review and a 2005 winner of the Jaro Johansson Prize of the European Economic Association. He's been recently appointed to the UK government's Leveling Up Advisory Council. Relevant to this conference, Tim was one of the two academic directors, along with Paul Collier, of the Commission on State Fragility, Growth and Development. Tim was awarded a knighthood in the 2018 New Year's Honours by the UK government for his services to economics and public policy. Tim has been the leading exponent of the new political economy, which has led to fruitful interdisciplinary conversations between economists and political scientists. Such productive exchanges between economists and, and political scientists is very evident in our conference. In his book, Pillars of Prosperity, the Political Economies of Developing Clusters, co-authored with Thurston Person, published by Princeton University Press, Tim argued that the absence of common interests and cohesive political institutions can explain the very different developing clusters in fragile states that are plagued by poverty, violence, and weak capacity. This book has had a huge influence in our thinking on how state building can be, can be, is, is possible in conflict-affected societies. It has shaped the work of several of our projects in UNU wider. In today's lecture, titled Trust as State Capacity, Tim will discuss the link between trust in government and building states that are effective in taxing, regulating, and providing public services. Tim, I'm pleased to invite you to provide the keynote lecture of the conference. Uh, thank you, Kenal, for that lovely introduction. It's one of those occasions that have my parents been here. Um, my uh, father uh, would have been proud and my mother would have believed you. Um, <laughs> and uh, it's lovely to be back in person. It's lovely to be back in Helsinki where in fact, the Yuri Janssen lectures were where we first developed the uh, Pillars of Prosperity book. Um, it's also lovely to be uh, wearing a tie again. I have a fantastic collection of ties, which I haven't been able to wear for two years. So forgive me for looking a little overly formal, but uh, I thought that it's too good an opportunity to, to pass up. Um, I'm going to talk about this theme, Trust to State Capacity, which is a slightly mea culpa moment because I don't think we took the ideas I'm going to talk about today sufficiently seriously in our earlier work on state capacity. And I think it fits, I hope you'll, you'll see it fits with some of the themes in the, in the conference uh, um, uh, that you, you've been uh, um, uh, participating in for over the last uh, day or so. Um, why are we here? I think we're here because we think it's important to build um, peace and to uh, develop effective states that can support that peace. And that's a very central topic, um, both in practical and academic terms to understand that. And when we give, an, we give an answer to why we think we can, what we can say about that and step back and say, what, what does the evidence tell us? I think it tells us that at the heart of that is developing some notion of cohesion within society that can uh, also be represented in the way that the state governs. Um, and there's sort of two broad themes in the, in the literature. Um, one that I think is more um, the view that economists have subscribed to, which is central to build the right kinds of institutional framework to support that cohesion. 
And the other, which I think is, is definitely alive and well, but perhaps less central to the economic approach, is the need to build a strong civic culture to support state building. And uh, there's now an established literature on state capacity, which has been developed in, in a variety of ways by a number of people. And what's important, and I'm going to draw this link out, that's that building state capacity is linked to peace. It, it, you know, whether it's causally linked, that's another matter, but it's certainly linked in the, in the sense that where we observe strong state capacity, that's strongly associated with, with, with peaceful environments. And it's linked also to strong institutional environments, and I'm going to be specific about what I mean by strong institutional environment in, in a moment. And um, I think the way economists are brought up to believe, at least perhaps I'm uh, just uh, too old and represent a past incarnation of this, but um, is that the way we build strong and effective states is by the accumulation of power within state structures. So the archetypal notion of a, a strong and effective state for an economist is a state run by a benevolent social planner who has sufficient authority to get done all of those wonderful things that benevolent planners want to do. And I think in many ways that's an unhelpful way to begin thinking about the challenge of effective policy um, and for reasons I'm going to, uh, to articulate. Um, uh, but I think that's a kind of starting point that we ought to be, um, we ought to be moving away from. But it, it's so firmly ingrained in the economic model of policymaking. Um, if you'd asked me when I, was a, when I was a graduate student what I was going to spend my career doing, um, I was so enamored with that idea that that's what economic policy economists do, that I thought my entire career would be devoted to um, looking at better ways for governments to intervene in economies and then lecturing policymakers until they took the idea seriously and that would materialize in a wonderful uh, and improved policy uh, setup. But a defining moment for me, although there was a sort of lag on the impact of this on my career, was when I went as an assistant professor to Princeton for my first uh, job and I ran into uh, a, a senior economist who's, who's now actually a dear friend um, uh, and he asked me what I worked on and I reeled off a list of things and rather proudly said uh, I listed among my interests economic development. And then he suddenly, his face suddenly turned to a very disapproving tone and uh, he said, you know, I used to be interested in economic development, but I realized all the problems of development were political and so I gave up being interested in economic development. Well, rather than giving up, I think what we've done as economists and this room reflects that, is to take seriously the political dimensions and think how to integrate those into our understanding of development. Now, just to sort of stand back, and there's sort of two big picture views there's the, of, of where effective states come from. And as I say, I think the first view is much more the one that's been traditionally embraced by economists, which I call the Leviathan view, which one associates, of course, with Hobbes, um, but also with Max Weber, that the state, the essential nature of the state is as a coercive authority uh, indeed, the state has a legitimate use of force. It's the only agent that we think should have a legitimate use of force. And the way it exercises that is by uh, investing in coercive compliance, which underpins state effectiveness. And, uh, and that improves detect detection and punishment for those who, who don't go along with what the, the state wants them to do. And I think that has, by and large, been the approach taken um, by economists. Um, there's another tradition quite distinct tradition, which I associate with Locke and Rousseau, but there's a long potential list here, is to think more of the state as a form of social contract, where citizens and states have mutual obligations, that, uh, that citizens are obliged to engage in certain kinds of pro-social behavior, which I'll, I'll talk a little bit later in the talk about what I mean by that exactly, and that states reciprocate by, um, by doing the kinds of things that, that by, will, in, will increase the welfare of their citizens. And on that view, building trust in the state is the key element of state effectiveness, building that recip strong reciprocal bond between state and citizens, and that's the way to move forward. Now, of course, no one ever believes in these either extreme versions, but I, I want to sort of somewhat argue that we've neglected, we meaning those of us who've been working on state capacity, have perhaps neglected the second at the expense of the first. What is state capacity? Well, how do I understand that idea? It's those things that enhance the ability of the state to get things done, increasing the feasible set of policies available to government, and also allowing you to implement policies more cheaply or more effectively. 
Um, there are general dimensions of state capacity, such as collecting taxes, fiscal capacity, enforcing laws, legal capacity, and having the ability to, um, uh, uh, to augment markets in the form of what I call collective capacity, which, which means the provision of healthcare, education, infrastructure, or whatever. They're also very specific, so that's a kind of generalized notion, but they're also very bespoke forms of state capacity, um, uh, public health, uh, capacity, defense, fighting climate change. The reason I mention that is there's a debate going on, which some of you will be familiar with, particularly in relation to climate change, of whether there are bespoke institutions that are needed, um, e even in weakly institutionalized environments. So I sit on, a, on a, an advisory group of the World Bank and IMF on sustainable and inclusive recovery. And one of the debates is, we, well, we know that we need to spend however many trillions of dollars on uh, low carbon alternatives. The real question is delivery. How do we actually conceptualize the capacity to deliver on that agenda. And the question is, do we just have to wait till states develop generalized state capacities, or should we be thinking of building specialized state capacities, for example, in the energy sphere, that allow states to make an energy transition, even if we accept that the generalized state capacity is, is not developed. But anyway, that's a debate that's, that's raging within, within the international policy community about what is the state capacity needed to support climate change. Um, what we know from the data, and it's not hardly surprising, is that, that state capacity clusters across space and, and accumulates over time, um, but is very, um, very slow to accumulate. There are very few countries that have made a meaningful transition. And uh, you know, when I go back and we're in Scandinavia, I read uh, Gunnar Myrdal's account of economic development, which of course led to a Nobel Prize. Um, he very much saw very stark nonlinear transformation as the key thing that we mean by development as distinct from growth. Growth patterns, of course, can be sometimes very nonlinear, but on the whole, they're cumulative. Whereas what Murdahl talks about are those transformational moments where you can move from one kind of society, polity and economy, to a different kind of society. And that's very, very rare, as we all know. So, you know, if you plot these are crude measures of state capacity and even harder to read because somehow my, uh, my slide is a little fuzzy. But basically, if you plot measures of fiscal capacity, legal capacity, and collective capacity, the really interesting thing, I think, when you look at this is um, you always get these red dots up here. These are the strong uh, and successful states, also peaceful states. Um, we're in one today. Um, and then you get sort of a mix. This is the middle-income countries, which are sort of generally somewhat distributed. And then this is the lower-income countries, which generally have lower state capacities. Now, of course, there's nothing causal about this. One interesting thing to do is to, is to uh, take a standard state fragility index and to just separate this out instead of high, low, and middle. And it won't surprise you that the non-fragile states are all up here and the fragile states are down here. Nothing surprising in any of this, but we know that there are these strong associations in the data. Why does state capacity matter? It matters directly because without it, you cannot provide the core, um, uh, uh, human uh, core support for human capability. That many of the things, the collective needs that societies need cannot be delivered upon without having a state that can raise revenues, and without having a state that can then spend those revenues in an effective manner and also promote prosperity by having an effective open um, uh, market economy. And all of that uh, is only feasible um, because a, a state has acquired the capacities to support that. But it's also sort of an indirect, so that's the kind of direct benefit from state capacity. But the indirect benefit is a kind of bellwether of flourishing societies, and I'll just show you one thing uh, in, in a couple of slides' time to illustrate what I mean by that. There are sort of two ends of the spectrum. We saw a little bit. Um, at one end of the spectrum are what I call the cohesive capitalist countries that have emerged mainly in the post-war era um, and have very strong state capacities um, and, um, uh, um, are in a sense, what I think many other countries in the world aspire to, not all, but most aspire to become. Uh, and then there are at the other end of the spectrum, the fragile states that function poorly on almost all dimensions of state capacity. Where does state capacity come from? Well, there's two sort of broad views. They that mirror the sort of two views of the state that I gave you up front. Um, one is that state capacity is a kind of top-down investment. 
And I, kind of, I, I like to think of it, I don't know how much you followed the literature on intangible capital, but if you look at modern firms and say, um, kind of how do they improve their productivity, the old fashioned view, I mean, being a little stuck in the way I'm expressing this, the old fashioned view is they did it by accumulating capital and human capital. A kind of more modern view is saying intangible capital is critical, how they, how, how they organize production, bring new methods into organizing production to increase productivity, and that's known as in, intangible capital. Uh, and I think of state capacity as a kind of key form of intangible capital. If you look through history, at key events in the history of many countries in which they built effective state capacity, it has been by reorganizing the state, not just by spending more money on physical capital of any kind, but actually realizing that a better form of organization is needed to deliver on specific things that the state does. Um, and state capacity in that world, if you believe the top-down approach, is, 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 is um, about creating these, in, these investments, um, particularly in intangibles. Um, the, other, the other kind of more bottom-up view is that cohesive polities emerge from a stronger social contract. And I'm, I'm going to talk about this later, so I won't say any more about this now. And the first, I think, is, is well understood. The second is work in progress. Um, where does trust fit into it? So I put trust in my title. I'm going to talk about trust a lot. Um, we know that there's a very big literature, and actually I think it was even touched on in, in sessions I, was, I, I participated as in the audience uh, yesterday. Um, trust figures as a central bellwether of effective societies. Um, and uh, interpersonal trust allows enforcement of contracts and cooperation in the provision of public goods. Trust in government, uh, again, has been massively studied um, by um, particularly political scientists, less so by economists, um, is distinct but related. There's an interesting debate, and not one I'm going to have time to go into today, about whether there's a kind of tension between interpersonal trust and trust in government, in the sense that in, 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 in cases where effective communities operate, does that actually push against the possibility of building an effective central state because people trust their community to deliver but not trust a central state. So there could even be, those two could be intention. In, in the data, there is a positive correlation between interpersonal trust and trust in government, but they're by far and away not just measuring the same thing. There's a huge literature, and I'm going to come to that later. Um, the, the sort of hook which links that literature to what I'm going to talk about today is the literature on government legitimacy. Again, a kind of slippery concept that, that many people have, have debated and discussed. Um, more among political scientists and lawyers than economists um, and, and also psychologists. And the, the, I guess the work I've been most influenced by is Margaret Levy's work. I'm going to talk about that later in the talk. But also Tom Tyler, who's a legal psychologist at uh, Yale, if you haven't read his work, particularly on um, trust. And we, we took evidence from from him when we did our Fragile States Commission and got very interesting. He's done a lot of work on police legitimacy, in particular in fragile contexts. How do you actually achieve a state that the citizens have any trust in, particularly policing? Um, very interesting work, if you don't know. The other work that, that um, my, my only recently erstwhile colleague, John Wagel, um, uh, uh, has been doing is now Berkeley on the D Democratic Republic of Congo with field experiments, which is very, very interesting on the role of legitimacy in building state capacity. So I'm going to talk about um, a few core ideas very briefly, and then I want to discuss where trust fits in, uh, and then I outline the puzzles, uh, a few puzzles and an agenda. So here's kind of how to, I, I, I kind of generally have thought about state capacity, that state capacity emerges because you, uh, you can build common interests. How do you build common interests? It's some combination of building institutions and having um, um, uh, norms and values that support those institutions, uh, willingness to cooperate in government and to compromise in particular, that common interests are central to building state capacities. They, they're institutionalized um, very often. That leads to better economic policy and the outcome that we, we in a sense all care about, which is peace and prosperity comes out at the, at the other end. What do we know is that underlying cleavages really matter. Sometimes you get severe headwinds from history, geography, and culture of things that are very hard to heal and have long-run consequences. Um, and among the set of institutions um, that really matter in my playbook, but we could debate this, is constraints on executive power. Um, in other words, being able to, to have real sanctions against policymakers who don't behave in the public interest. 
uh, ultimately is what matters. It's sort of some, sometimes, and I don't want to uh, accuse anyone in the audience of this, it sometimes it, it is forgotten as what I would regard as the core pillar of democracy because of the obsession about conduct, conduct of elections. And one of the, the lessons in the, that we, we drew out of the, um, out of the uh, State uh, Fragility Commission was that the rush by the international community to run elections in post-conflict societies can be an error before you've built the kinds of executive constraints that means whoever wins that election isn't just going to have a kind of winner-takes-all mentality. Um, so I, I want to sort of downweight the, 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 the idea that elections are what key to democracy and upweight what is uh, that it's really constraints on power from either legal systems or having genuine power sharing through having an executive that's genuinely accountable to a legislature, et cetera, et cetera. Okay. Torsten and I, in our earlier work, we kind of rather, you know, it's always a dangerous thing to, to make broad brush generalizations, but it didn't stop us. Um, uh, we said there are basically three kinds of states in the world, um, cohesive states, redistributive states, and weak states. Cohesive states are those that are peaceful and prosperous. Redistributive states are those that are authoritarian but generally functional. And weak states are those that are generally chaotic and dysfunctional. Um, and when we did that, um, we did that based on a, a, a purely theoretical model. So this is the kind of worst way to reach a conclusion from many persons, uh, people's point of view. You write down a model and your model tells you there are these three kinds of states. Well, only relatively recently, we actually used a machine learning algorithm to, do, to sort across characteristics of states and used a clustering algorithm to actually ask us if we fed in a whole multidimensional vector of things that states do, whether it's tax raising or providing um, support for various kinds of public goods, what did we get? Um, uh, and, and, and the answer is this we actually, the, the clustering algorithm actually comes out with three sets of states in the world um, based on their ranking on political violence and their ranking on various measures of state capacity. And there are basically two dimensions. So even in the data, it tells you, roughly speaking, there are two dimensions when you look at the principal components across all of these correlated variables. One we call um, peace and the other one we call state capacity because that's what we're minded to do so. And basically, these are these two dimensions. So the dimension in uh, this dimension is the peace dimension. Um, but be, be clear about one thing. We do not classify, and I may say a little bit more about this later, we do not classify repressive states as peaceful. Um, we regard repressive states, those that are only able to establish social order because somebody is essentially repressing the opposition is not a, a, an acceptable definition of peace in our notion of what's peace and prosperity. Now that is a kind of controversial statement to throw in here, but I think it's a very important statement because a lot of conflicts end, think of Syria today, simply because of repression by one party on another set of parties. We can call that peace if you like, I'm very happy for you to say that's better than conflict, but I think it's an important observation that there are many countries in repressed conflict where one party is essentially repressing the interests of many others. And a lot of what we call the redistributive states in our schema are states that are only functional because of widespread use of repression of large groups of citizens. That's important because right down here, you're gonna see one of our middle group states is China. China is a highly repressive state um, it's a relatively peaceful state. You wouldn't say it was an open conflict, but it achieves that only by having um, um, uh, um, rule by one group that represses the interests of the majority. Um, but what you see are the green states. These are the cohesive states. Um, these are the redistributive states on the whole. You can unpack each of these and decide whether you like their classification. This is just what the computer tells you. And these are the, the weak states that are generally the conflict-ridden states. Um, what's interesting is we, we just we took those the classification from here and we plotted it against the World Values Survey measure of life satisfaction at the country level, and you get the following picture, namely that the the blue the, the sorry the green states up here are generally the states with higher levels of life satisfaction. The blue states are in the middle, and then the red states are around the bottom. And that's something we, we didn't put life satisfaction into the measure, and simply it just came out this way. So 
you know, having started with a slightly crazy theoretical idea, there should be three kinds of states. First of all, the computer didn't disagree, and third of all, we just plotted against life satisfaction, and it looked the way we would have expected it to look. Now, I'm not going to overclaim <laughs> by any means, but it was sort of a, uh, an interesting uh, corroboration. So what's trust got to do with it? Um, I haven't really talked about that now. Um, Trust is central to our understanding of the legitimacy and effectiveness of states. And as I said earlier, that we largely live with two concepts of trust. Trust in people, um, either uh, interpersonal trust, or trust in elites of one kind or another. There's a lot of uh, looking at, for example, business elites and other, other groups. There's, uh, uh, and, and, and then there's sort of trust in institutions. And I think one of the big in interesting unresolved trust issues that I've never seen satisfactorily resolved is what I call the autopilot versus pilot problem. Uh, in, in other words, is the way to resolve, think about, you know, I'm, I'm about to go on a plane, you're probably all going to fly on a plane in the next few days. You know, so what makes you trust uh, the plane when you get on, on board? There's two ways you can trust the plane. One is you trust Airbus, whoever created it, to build a really excellent plane that, that has all sorts of computerized systems that allow the pilot to do a bad job, but the plane will still <laughs> land safely. The other is because you trust the pilot. At the end of the day, you think it doesn't matter how the plane was made. As long as you have a good, trustworthy pilot, that, you know, if things go wrong, it'll be the pilot that rescues you. Um, and trust is a little bit like that. There's a big debate about, is trust about getting the right people into decision-making positions, or is it about designing a more effective, equivalent of more effective plane, uh, a more effective set of institutions that mean any, any old person can get in and run the show, and it doesn't really matter very much because they're so constrained by the institutional environment. You know, the plane has so many things that mean every mistake the pilot would make would be anticipated by the computer and, 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 and offset. Um, and you know, when, we are, when we're building trust in society, I think we have the same dilemma. Are we trying to build fail-safe things, or are we trying to just find better ways of selecting the responsible individuals to run the world? Of course, it's some of both. But I think, uh, I think in many circumstances, you, you, know, you have to reflect, is it even feasible to do the equivalent of building a better plane? Or are you basically, at the end of the day, the only way to guarantee trust is to find the kinds of people who are going to behave responsibly when given the... The, um, the, the opportunity to, uh, to run the show. The great thing about working in this space, and many of you will have done this, is there's just so much data. In fact, the problem is there is so much data that it's very hard to know how to make sense of it. Um, you know, we, we've, in the broader project that this forms part of, we've been using Gallup, we've been using Integrated Value Survey, we've been using Barometer Surveys, we've been using the European Social Surveys. There's just lots and lots of data, and the real question is how on earth to make sense of it. So I'm going to talk more today about a way of making sense of it than I am about the data, although I'm going to show you quite a lot of data. Just to sort of uh, provide a sort of very casual link, this is just for the European subsample. Um, if you put a capacity, state capacity index on the horizontal axis and a measure of trust in institutions on the vertical axis, Access, you do find that there, I was hoping this would be true if I took a global sample, but it gets a little cluttered in the global sample. Um, so I want to just outline very quickly a conceptual framework that I found useful for thinking through some of these issues. It's largely motivated by work by uh, Margaret Levy, who uh, um, has actually become a co-author of mine, uh, partly through this process, which has been fun. Margaret, for those of you who don't know her, is a political scientist at Stanford and wrote two what I think are really landmark books. So I, you know, if you learn nothing else this morning, you might go and read one of Margaret's books if you haven't already. Um, she has a book called Of Rule and Revenue, which rather, I mean, we cited in our earlier work, but I didn't really get what, we, what, what she was saying in our early, earlier work, which is a book about building effective states in the 19th century, particularly the historical record on the role of taxation and the centrality of taxation in state building. Um, and the second, which is, I think, a little less well-known, is called Consent, Dissent, and Patriotism, which is why do people volunteer uh, for military service? Uh, again, looking across a variety of countries. And the, the answer is basically um, she comes up with two terms uh, in those books. The first term, this notion of quasi-voluntary compliance, that what a state can do to be effective is not to to browbeat or to co coerce people. It's to convince people that it's in their public interest to support various elements to make the state function better, the obvious one being to pay your taxes. Um, 
but that uh, and, and, and states that rely on heavily on, on coercive compliance are actually in general more ineffective. It's a little bit like my point about it, if the only way you can get people to do things in a state is to be extremely repressive and to threaten them in all sorts of ways to do it, that doesn't sound like a very peaceful state to me. I mean, might like to some others, but that doesn't sound like what we mean by a peaceful state. What's a peaceful state, in a sense, is one where people feel a sufficiently strong sense of obligation to want to cooperate with that state and do things that are in the public interest voluntarily or quasi-voluntarily, to use Margaret's term. The other is conditional consent that the idea in, in her work on, on, uh, on, on, on volunteering to fight is that people are, are willing to volunteer to fight and to put their lives on the line only when they feel that the, the, goal, that the goals of that state are, are just. If they have a perception that they're being asked to fight in an unjust conflict, it's very hard to get people to voluntarily, uh, um, uh, um, uh, to volunteer for military conflict. And, uh, on the whole, I mean, this is a complicated issue. I've done a bit of reading on it. Um, um, volunteer armies seem to be much more effective than coerced armies, conscript armies, and also paid armies. But that's, you know, I couldn't prove that, and I don't know anybody could. But the idea that, uh, that comes out of this work is that government and citizens are in a kind of reciprocal relationship, and that's the foundation of a social contract. So how do we think about this? There's a kind of, so if anyone's interested, I can, uh, we have uh, various um, theoretical papers on this now which spell this out in a sort of usual economic model. But think, and, 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 and I'm gonna slip into, into COVID a, a little bit because uh, the COVID example is so good for thinking about this problem um, um, in terms of the kinds of issues it raises. So I might slip into COVID a little bit. Um, but government faces a policy problem that is very uncertain in the eyes of, the, of, of its citizens. And the obvious example is whether to introduce a lockdown during a pandemic. For most of us who ever faced that, we'd never faced anything like it before. Um, and the question is, when governments asked us to stay at home, did we find that the arguments based, that that was based on compelling or not? And you know, we have various institutions in different countries designed to try and convince us that we were doing the right thing. It's highly uncertain in interesting environments what the right policy is. Um, we may never know whether the, any war that we fight was indeed just or not. Um, but uh, uh, what, what really matters is that governments have limited capacity to coercively get citizens to do what they want them to do. Um, and, uh, co and compliance is costly for many citizens, as it was in the pandemic, staying at home. Now, as an economist, you know, you, you, you kind of reach for the economist playbook and you ask yourself, what's the best way to think about how people are motivated in such contexts? And of course, in the classic economic model, which we mistakenly, in my view, teach to our students, we make the self-interest assumption and just say, well, people will do it if it's in their interest, self-interest to do it. Um, but if that's the case, if that's the right model, then pretty much your only hope is to coercively comply them, uh, get them to coercively comply if they're only going to do it, if the, if the, if the cost of not complying is, 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 is going to offset their, um, their, their cost of, of, of complying. Um, but there's thankfully very compelling evidence that that's a very bad model of how citizens uh, behave in reality, that actually citizens are willing to do the right thing um, when they're convinced that they are doing the right thing. And there's lots of work in economics. So I'm not saying economists have been blind to this. Um, but there are lots of also different ways of conceptualizing it. So some of you may be familiar with, for example, uh, Jean Tourol and Roland Bernabou's work on pro-social motivation. Um, and they have a kind of um, reputation on signaling model to think about why people are willing to behave in a, in a pro-social way. But there's lots of different views, including, by the way, just hardwired, you know, that we have some evolutionary tendency to be pro-social because historically, either, either culturally or biologically, species that develop those pro-social tendencies tend to have been more successful through the history than those that haven't. But anyway, there are lots of ways of conceptualizing this. In the model, governments announce policy, uh, and, and, and among the things they announce when they announce a policy is what, what, what will happen if you don't comply, and then citizens choose whether to comply. High compliance makes the policy more effective. So a lockdown, announcing a lockdown is one thing. Having citizens staying at home is another thing. Uh, and the, in the end of the day, the policy is more effective when more citizens comply with it. Why does trust matter? 
Um, well, it ma might matter interpersonally. I might ask myself the question, why should I comply with this policy if I don't think my citizen fellow citizens are going to do it? But also, um, you might make an assessment of whether government is actually implementing this policy for good reasons or bad reasons. Um, and that um, if you look around vaccine hes hesitancy when, when it really emerged, there was a long, lot of suspicion among the vaccine hesitant, at least in some quarters, there's survey evidence on this, that they thought it was because Big Pharma was essentially lobbying governments to make a lot of money out of selling vaccines. So that would be a mistrust in government. I don't really think the government's doing this for good reasons. They're doing it because somebody is lobbying them to do it to make a lot of money out of this intervention. So that would be a kind of mistrust underpinning of, of unwillingness to go along with a particular policy. Now, you can model this if you're an economist. You kind of get sucked into economics, and, and you can model this as kind of Bayes' rational citizens um, updating their beliefs, but you can also, there's a, and, and in the wider project that I'm, um, I'm working on where this comes out, we're also interested in non-Bayes rational um, versions of this, particularly where governments use things like narratives. And in fact, on Thursday and Friday of this week, the Hyatt program at LSE is organizing a symposium of psychologists, anthropologists, economists, I can't remember, lots of other disciplines on radical uncertainty and how people actually make decisions. And it's, I think most people, they've already, to come to the workshop, they've already agreed that the Bayes rational model of economics isn't the greatest model. Anyway, um, why, why, why does trust matter in this context, trust in government? If citizens trust government, they're more likely to comply. I've made that claim, I'm gonna show you a bit of evidence. Um, and government, if, if, Government, why, how do you gain the trust of citizens? You gain the trust of citizens because um, you, you, you believe the, 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 the government is motivated to do the thing that, that is in the public interest. This has extensive margin and intensive margin benefits. What do I mean by that? The extensive margin is certain kinds of interventions are only feasible because you have the trust of your citizens given your limited coercive power. So you know, some of the interventions, again, I'll come back to the pandemic, some of the interventions that, that some governments tried during the pandemic were simply infeasible unless you could rely on voluntary compliance because there was no way the state had the capacity to implement them coercively. So therefore, your only hope of having that policy was the hope that the citizens would buy into it. Um, the other is a more intensive margin argument which says conditional on having the policy, you just get more compliance. So actually, it's not whether you have the policy or not, it's, it's also whether the policy happens effectively. What about some evidence? Um, I'm going to use six waves of the World Value Survey and five waves of the European Value Survey, sometimes known as the Integrated Value Survey. Those are, I know those surveys essentially ask all the same questions. There's a bit of work you have to do to integrate them, but they're basically, you can treat them as a single data set. It overweights the European sample for obvious reasons, but it, it, it gives you a slightly bigger data set. I'm going to show you a little bit of evidence data on trust in institutions and attitudes towards voluntary compliance, and I'm going to show you that there's a really strong association in the data between trust and compliance. Um, one thing, there's lots of other data sets you can do. One thing we've done is using the cohort study in the UK to look at compliance with COVID regulations, and you've guessed it. People who, and you can do this when you actually look at changing trust over time, but it's a, it's a panel study. So people whose trust in the government went down also were less likely to comply. So you can do, even do uh, individual fixed effects and look at the pattern of trust changing over time. But I'm going to do all this on cross-country data. Um, basically, um, I'm going to take the trust question for institutions uh, or government institutions from that. Um, people are asked to say how, whether they have a lot of confidence or not in government, justice systems and courts, parliament, police, civil service. I'm going to just, you know, I could look at them individually. Last week I, I gave a lecture to some civil servants, so I pulled out the civil service data to show them uh, which countries had high trust in civil service, but I have no mandate today to speak to any particular group in the audience, so we're just going to amalgamate those. They're very highly correlated, as you'd expect. People who, who are confident in one or other of those institutions are probably confident in others, and we, we just produce a first principle component based on some factor loadings. Um, we do the same for a index, and again, I can do individual things. In fact, I'll show you a little bit of evidence from individual things in a minute. But basically, you can have a set of compliance questions, and they ask conditional compliance questions in the data. They say, would you be willing to pay higher taxes to protect the environment? You know, how far that's related to trust in government, you could, you could debate. Are, are, would you be willing to fight for your nation if called on? And is it justifiable to cheat on your taxes? 
Now, one of the things that's surprising, at least to some people, is discover if you look at actually the in, in about almost half a million observations that we have in the integrated value survey for the justifiable cheat on your taxes, about 67% of populations thinks, think it is not justifiable to cheat on your taxes. So for all the view that people only pay their taxes coercively, that really speaks to the Margaret Levy view that actually many people um, uh, believe you sh should. Mind you, I, it reminds me of a story, so I'm not going to name names, but a, 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 a right-wing economist who I got to know quite well decided to pull his kids out of the public school system in the US and homeschool them because he was convinced that public schooling was brainwashing his kids into being willing to pay higher taxes. Um, <laughs> So uh, may, maybe he had a point, I don't know. Uh, anyway, um, if you plot um, an index of voluntary compliance against an index of trust in institutions, you will find that that's up and sloping looking at the cross-country variation. That's not so surprising. But the interesting thing is you can look at this within country too and take country fixed effects out and looked at the relationship between voluntary and compliance and trust within countries. Uh, controlling for anything you can control for in that, in that survey. And I'm, not, I'm going to go, gloss over this quickly because basically I'm doing the thing you're not meant to do in economics anymore. Apparently stars are banned now. You're not allowed to show stars on regression coefficients, partly because anyone only looks at the stars. So you give a seminar and you put stars. People just ignore all the other coefficients. They just look at, look at the stars. Well, I'm doing, I'm, I'm, I'm doing that too. So these are stars. Basically, the, the bottom line is this is the question on in increasing taxes if used to fight pollution. Very strong uh, link within countries, within, within countries, so looking at individual answers and confidence in government. Same for willingness to fight for your country. Same for justifiable to cheat on your taxes. Interpersonal trust, by the way, if I put that in, I could show you that, does not do any work in this. So it does suggest that this is specific to trust in government, not interpersonal trust. Um, a little bit of evidence from the pandemic. Governments made heavy use of voluntary compliance, as we know, on things like social distancing, vaccine update, and wearing masks would be examples. Um, we would expect countries with strong traditions of voluntary compliance to uh, make more use, sorry, of strong, strong traditions of trust and voluntary compliance historically to make more use of voluntary measures during the pandemic. And um, we've recently started using, it's very messy, this is my pre-doc student who's actually going to do his PhD at Stanford next year. He's, he, Chris Dan. Chris, Chris and I have been trying to use the CoronaNet data. You can download it from this CoronaNet project. What it is is a global effort to code all COVID interventions across the globe, what governments did, when they did it, and what kind of method of compliance they use, which is why we were particularly interested, whether they had to use enforcement or whether they relied on voluntary compliance. So what we've done is just to pull out the proportion of COVID interventions that relied on voluntary compliance. We've only, the data is quite messy, so I'm only gonna show you it for the European plus US sample. Um, eventually, not in the not too distant future, we'll be able to show this more globally. Um, what you find if you take that sample is countries at the top, uh, this is the proportion of interventions that relied on voluntary compliance. Down at the bottom, uh, well at the top you have places like uh, um, Denmark, Sweden, there's Finland, um, and then at the bottom you have countries like Italy, uh, Romania and Greece. Um, and then if you plot that against, take the IVS data that I just showed you, look at the proportion of interventions that use voluntary compliance, um, that, that uh, is upward sloping, meaning that countries that have higher levels of voluntary compliance in the IVS tended to be the countries that relied more on voluntary compliance during the pandemic. And also, it's even a you know, more striking picture if you look at the trust in state institutions question. Countries that had much stronger trust in state institutions tended to implement interventions that relied on voluntary compliance. Um, so some evidence that governments understand their citizens indeed um, my co-author, Torsten Persson, who's been recently on a post-corona commission in Sweden. Sweden, as you know, one of the interesting things, if you contrast Sweden, um, Denmark, and Finland, they had quite different corona experiences. The common thing that you had in Sweden was they relied very, very heavily on voluntary, voluntary compliance, and, but, but have fared rather badly in the pandemic, at least by their own standards of success. So there's been a lot of interest in why, why that is. But I remember talking to Torsten very early in the pandemic, about the, Swed the Swedish approach, we used to call it in Britain, the Swedish approach. The Swedish approach being just to trust your citizens 
try and give them advice about the right way to behave and, and not to spend too much time on coercion. Um, anyway, okay, so the story so far, I'm going to wrap up fairly, fairly soon. Um, the story so far is that uh, elements of voluntary compliance are, are, are useful, uh, are used in policy. They lower costs of implementation. They expand the set of feasible policies. I haven't really justified it fully. There are strong correlations in the data linking willingness to comply and trust in state institutions. Um, so, of course, where we want to go next, and, and I'm not, I'm just, I'm sort of treading on very well um, trodden territory here, is where does, so it really makes us want to think, where does trust come from? So I just sort of treated trust as something that's out there, um, and the question is, where does it come from? And a huge number of people have already con tried to contribute to that. Um, there's a kind of institutionalist view, which I think, again, is the one economists feel moderately more comfortable about. It's like, you build a better plane. If you want more trust in government, you, you, you do the equivalent of making the autopilot work really well. That's going to get citizens to trust their government. If somebody sets a foot wrong, there's either going to be a lawyer or a, or a judge on their back, or there's going to be a vote against them in parliament. You, you have to improve the institutions. That's kind of one view. Um, and there, even there, though, you know, maybe the best way to do it is to improve selection, um, not just incentives. Um, the other is to look into, into cultural factors, the deep-seated determinants, um, where, where particularly more polarized and fragmented societies maybe find it more difficult to get a feeling of, of, of trust. What we do know is that there's huge persistence of historical experiences, um, which makes this very difficult to think through. Uh, and I'll make a few observations, and then there's a bigger agenda. So one, one thing that I will show you um, to link back to the stuff we did on state capacity is that trust in institutions um, is much stronger in countries with long histories of um, strong uh, executive constraints, um, which we would expect if the institutionalist view had any merit. It doesn't work so well with democracy, by the way, and that comes to my point about you really do need to separate out these dimensions of democracy, but I won't, I won't harp on that now. One thing I did literally um, right at the 11th hour before this presentation, I thought I'd look at average conflict levels between 1975 and 2016. As I said to you, we, Torsten and I are very particular about viewing repression as, as a different alternative to peace. So these are countries that are not an open conflict, but according to various measures, have severe repression against oppositional forces in the societies sustaining uh, whoever's in power in power. And what you see is that the peaceful countries tend to have greater trust in state institutions. Those countries with some history of civil war uh, have, have less trust, and then the repressive countries are a little worse than, than the peaceful countries, or a bit, but they're um, not as bad as the conflict countries. So suggesting there may be something interesting here, and indeed um, I'll show you something else on that in a minute. Um, there's a very large existing literature, you, some, many of you will, on, on, but, but more on the interpersonal trust front than there is on the trust in government front, at least my reading. I have read quite a lot of stuff on, in, on, on this now. The, the, the piece you'll probably, many of you will know is this JEP piece, which is a kind of meta study of a variety of studies on interpersonal trust and conflict, um, which argues, if anything, periods of conflict increase interpersonal trust. And I think someone referred to that in one of the panels I was at um, yesterday, but, but there's much less on how this affects trust in, um, in, in government. One of the lines of work, and I'll finish here, um, that, that's getting very popular and interesting um, among economists that trying to, to, to study some of these things is the kind of impressionable years um, work. Um, the idea is that, that salient events that you encounter in the early years of your life and there's some sort of psychological, socio-psychological um, underpinnings of this idea leave a much bigger lasting impact on your um, beliefs. So there was a paper some of you may have seen called Growing Up in a Recession um, a few years ago in the Review of Economic Studies showing that people who grow up in a recession seem to have long-lasting different views about redistribution than people who didn't grow up in a recession. Um, so taking that idea seriously, one can unpack sort of the early years experience of people in these different data sets, and, and you can do a lot of it because there's a lot of data. Um, one of the things that's well known, but I'm going to pull this out a little more in a minute, is exposure to communism in Eastern Europe and the persistent effects of that. Um, 
but there's other, other things you can do. So, so in some work with Sasha Dre, which a lot of what I'm talking about today is joint with Sasha, we've kind of um, looked across a whole range of different exposures in impressionable years, different things from both political and economic data sets to see how many of those appear to have some correlation with trust in uh, government institutions. And, uh, you know, we, we could... 24 is what I'm going to show you, but, you know, we could have had 48, probably 72 easily. Um, but here's a few sort of things that we've, we've been looking at, is whether you were brought up under colonial rule, whether you were young when there was a founding democratic election, um, founding autocratic election, whether, whether there was a consumption disaster, whether there was some kind of systemic crisis, banking crisis, currency crisis, inflation, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and, uh, and mostly, and, and I'm, I'm not, this is the full 24, so we didn't pick them because we had some stars to show you. We just picked a load of indicators and just decided to show you what, what comes out. One of the interesting ones is civil war down here. So if you were brought up in a civil war in um, your impressionable years, which is defined to be less than 25, um, then you tend to have less trust in government as a consequence. So this is very much work in progress. This was done literally in the last few, few, few days. Um, of course, the, the, the last refuge of scoundrels is, is going to be, we, why are we doing this? Because we're interested in the possibility of an IV approach where we use these first stages of impressionable years to predict your confidence in government, to, to then ask whether the voluntary compliance relationship that I showed you earlier um, is robust to instrumenting trust. And the answer is yes, um, if you use some of these indicators. But again, that's work in, work in progress. Something that a lot of people have observed um, is, is the, this is just for Europe, the, the legacy of communism in Europe is, is one of mistrust. This is a confidence map, confidence in government map for Europe. Um, and uh, although sort of defining this as all Europe is a little, it's perhaps a little geographically stretching, but anyway, this is Russia, of course. Um, on the whole, you see much less trust in the former communist countries. Um, if you then look at cohorts of people within those countries, according to whether they were or are not actually brought up under communism, you get strong relationships between confidence and government. So people who lived under communism are today still less trusting of government than the people who were not exposed to communism living in the same countries, even controlling for age. Um, the same for the number of years of exposure to that. And that shows up in trust in institutions and in, um, and in volu and the voluntary compliance index I showed you from the integrated value survey, um, which again suggests that when we're trying to look and understand what we might be up against if we think this trust, compliance, state capacity nexus is important, is um, sort of headwinds from major historical Events. One, one calculation, I was actually doing this on the plane, so I couldn't show you it uh, today. By the way, I've, I'm sure many of you have experienced planes were the place I always used to get any work done. Now I know why I was so unproductive during COVID. Um, no internet, and you just sit there on the plane and you work. Anyway, so watch the productivity effect of me being allowed to travel again. I'd be much more... Anyway, I was doing this back-of-envelope calculation because you can ask, given the age structure of a population... If that population was exposed to a significant negative shock, what is the speed of convergence at which that, that effect will go away? So how long is the legacy, given the size of the effect, how long is the legacy of communism going to last? I mean, is it going to be 20 years into the future, 30 years into the future? When do we expect, if we, no, nothing else happens, of course, which is never is going to be the case, what is the speed of convergence? And you can use these type of calculations given rates of migration, which you also have to take into account, and birth and death rates, the speed at which there'll be kind of cultural convergence um, based on these type of estimates, which I think is a, an interesting back of the envelope thing to do to say how, how big are these effects and how long will they, will they last. Okay, so, so I've, I've, I've offered you a bit of a canter through a lot of things, and I'm sure I've hopefully provoked you into, into thinking about a, a few of them. Um, what, I, what, what I've tried to do is to outline that we should be giving a more central role to, to, the, to this, to, to, to trusting government in, to being central to the way we think about this nexus of peace, prosperity, state capacity, 
that somehow trust belongs in there and hasn't perhaps been sufficiently central. I'm very intent, and, 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 and this is important, that, that part of what we were doing uh, in the work with Torsten earlier is in integration. What, what we noted, there were these different literatures all going off in their own directions, not speaking to each other. And one example was the literature on conflict and the literature on state capacity were not really being linked. And so all we were trying to do was to link them. So, so I'm not claiming today that I'm kind of going off in new directions. What I'm trying to do is to say we need an integrated understanding of these issues that doesn't just say, oh, I study trust in government and I'm going to study it totally in isolation from being interested in conflict, being interested in state bill. It's got to all be integrated and that's the thing I want you to take away. Um, but it means we need to get into studying the origins of trust, the, inst the institutional and cultural factors, and, and also, what do we mean by trust building? So I've been doing some work. I really want to show you this, but it hasn't converged at, th at this point, on truth and reconciliation commissions around the world and the impact on social attitudes in the countries that have had them. There does seem to be some evidence, but it's not robust enough, I dare show you it, that countries that have held truth and reconciliation commissions do seem to be creating higher trust among the citizens who are exposed, again, using... Um, time varying exposure to those things, but, it, but I, well, I've already overclaimed because of the results. As I say, we're not sure really what we're dealing with. But I think there's some interesting questions about institutional change. Another wing of this research agenda, which uh, may or may not be relevant in different contexts, is deliberative processes. Um, I've got very interested recently, partly because as a policymaker, I've said on the National Infrastructure Commission, we've been using deliberative processes to look at receptiveness to various. Um, um, policy changes, particularly in the environmental space, but also looking at public transport versus congestion pricing and other things. I do think these deliberative processes are interesting. I don't know how far we can push them, but I do think they have also potential in this kind of trust building nexus. How do you get citizens to buy into things where well, you talk to them and you try and extract and, and educate through, through those institutions? So, so I guess the unsatisfactory part, although good for all of us academics, is there's a lot still to be learned, um, and the causal patterns are not likely to be very simple. Um, the idea that economics has kind of become this cause, this effect, is not going to be a strategy. I mean, it will have a role to play in the bigger picture, for sure. But there's going to be no simple story at the end that I'm finding some magic bullet. If we just do this, the world will be different. I don't think that's how it's going to look. And the dynamics are particularly tricky, because these are things that play out typically over at least generations. Maybe they can be quicker than that, but they're going to they're be occurring at a relatively slow pace, and therefore we need to think about our time frame in policy, which is often urgency, versus the, the realistic time frame for shifting the dial on some of the things I've been talking about today. And that's a real challenge, both in managing our expectations, but also in, in thinking how we're going to create a narrative around policy making that is realistic for the people who we're trying to communicate with. Anyway, I've said enough, and probably too much. Thank you very much. Thank you. Tim, thank you for a fascinating lecture, especially setting on a very exciting agenda for all of us here on how we should think about trust in the state institutions as a part of building state capacity and on the debates on, on peace building. Um, I'm going to take, th we're going to take three questions at a time uh, from the audience here and also the online audience. And uh, I can already see some hands up, so just wait for the mic to get to you. I have to start with Patricia right in front of me, Omar there, and gentleman there. So first, let's just take these three questions together. Thank you very much, Tim. That was an uh, excellent talk. Not unexpected, but <laughs> thank you. Um, one uh, question about trust, I guess more a comment. Uh, we actually have been discussing about uh, this paper we have with colleagues here at UNY, the, where we recovered the same result, that, uh, that trust in, govern in governments are associated with compliance during COVID. But then we start asking the question, where is trust coming from? And one of the big effects we find is the 2007-2008 financial crisis, which have led to this massive reduction in trust in Europe. And then we find this interesting result, which is uh, people affected by the crisis and this massive reduction in trust actually seem 
to uh, obey more the, 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 the public health policies, but it turns out it's not because they trust the state, it's just because they do not trust the state to actually provide what they need. So they kind of go into themselves and all, something that appears to be compliance is actually not compliance, it's people actually having a deep mistrust of the state. So I wonder what are your thoughts about this kind of more subtle interpretation of this. Thanks, Patricia. Omar, please. Great, thanks very much. I wanted to ask you about the implication of your argument for ethnic diversity and national identity. So we have a, a reasonably robust amount of evidence now that shows there's a negative relationship between social cohesion and ethnic diversities in societies. <coughs> so, and in fact, some of that, in fact, has been traced to foreign-born populations that where you have countries with high levels of immigrant-based diversity uh, that we see lower levels of social cohesion. And the causal logic being that uh, individuals who may come from different countries, their relationship between state and society is very different, and their levels of trust in public institutions is very different. So what does that then mean for, uh, I guess, our policies around integration and our policies around immigration? And more generally, I wonder um, if you were to substitute in your various empirical um, correlations that you've attempted, ethnic diversity for trust, whether you've discovered that they're in fact, perhaps trust is just a, an intervening or an intermediate variable, and what might be driving this is indeed um, just how strong national identities are as an uh, important state capacity. Thanks, Omar. Question from... Thank you. Thank you very much. My, my name is Benjamin Petrini. I'm a research fellow at the International Institute for Strategic Studies. I'm, I'm curious to hear your view on the implications of this work for current uh, uh, fragile states. And if you would uh, differentiate uh, uh, the work or the approach on fragile states and on conflict affected countries and so what what would be the difference in the in the approach in those i mean you you hinted in some of your conclusions on on the need to investigate the origins of trust how do we look at trust in countries that have gone through repeated cycles of conflict and violence thank you thanks tim that is a fantastic question i'm going to give very brief answers to maximize uh, the uh, potential participation so forgive me for that um, um, just on the last question, I'll go in, in, in reverse order. Um, the, I, I see Adnan Khan over there who was on the Federal States Commission with me. And we had a really interesting e experience, which I think speaks exactly to your question, with the Tunisian, I think it was the Deputy Prime Minister of Tunisia who gave evidence to the Federal States Commission. And when, after the Arab Spring, um, when Tunisia was in an extremely fragile place, um, uh, there was a question about what would be the policy agenda of, of the new Tunisian government. And of course, places like the IMF and World Bank had their own agendas, and you know, they would have been telling them, you know, invest in schools or whatever they thought. It turns out that the policy that the Tunisian government came up with with the time was, we are going to clean the mosques. And that was a very interesting trust-building moment. It had two elements. One was it was the policy agenda of the country. It wasn't the policy agenda of some... 26-year-old with a PhD in economics had been flown in to give policy advice. It was actually something that came from the policymakers themselves. And second of all, it wasn't on any international policy list, no donor, no international organization. And I think it was a very interesting example of what trust building can mean when, when and, and, and often it is, it is to listen to the people in situ who, who understand they're trying to take, I mean, it, perhaps it, 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 the, again, another theme in our, in our report was pivotal moments. You have to, trust building can happen at pivotal moments. You can lose trust. A new government comes in um, and, and it's very easy for that government to make a mess and to lose trust. But you, first of all, you have to look at the pivotal moments. Second of all, you really do have to think of trust building. And it was the, the Thankfully, the politicians were very aware of that in a way that external actors were not. And I think that's something I'll just raise out as a question. You know, when you have external actors crawling all over the governments of fragile states, telling them what their policy agendas are, 
I don't think that's often the greatest way to build trust um, because it's, it's got to be something that is internally generated and motivated. Now, of course, that's a much bigger issue than I said, but that's a, that's a small answer. I think the ethnic diversity question is very interesting, and I can, you know, the empirical work we're doing is, is very much work in progress, and I, am, I can promise you're going to take your suggestion very seriously of seeing where, where it fits into the story. Um, I, think, I think the thing I take away partly from what you're saying, and I think some countries are more aware of this than others, is sort of integration, how you do integration um, of, uh, of, of people coming from places with different, as you said, sort of background, cultural values, and so forth, is absolutely key. Again, I'm not sure, we, I'm, I'm not sure how much we, we understand that as an agenda item. It's certainly not something that most economists would spend time on. Hopefully, um, the... Uh, the um, um, uh, 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 other social sciences do, do worry about this a lot more. In fact, I know some social psychologists who worry about these issues a lot more. But I think you're, you're quite right to put the spotlight on this. And I, I don't, I, you're quite right to say I didn't talk about this much, but it is sort of in the background. But I'll, I'll, uh, I, I, I will take your question away. Um, I, I, on, on Patricia's question, I mean, it's a, it's a great point and a subtle point like you make that maybe, maybe it really is the case that um, that this is indicative of mistrust, and I, I'm, I'm sort of trying to to think about ways where we can test one view versus another. And I, you know, we, we, we should talk some more because I did I did see your paper, and it's very very interesting. So you make sure everyone in the room has seen your paper. But and but, but I think the other interesting thing that you raise in your paper, which is very consistent with what I was talking about, is um, the role of these significant events. And the financial crisis was an, an interesting one. I mean, um, I was a policymaker as. as can I mention during the during the um, the financial crisis, and we all partly because we were in sort of not what would have been smoke-filled rooms 20 years ago. I don't know what they are now, but rooms full of people very intensively focusing on the world falling apart. Um, and um, you know there was a lot of concern: how do we affect? How do we stop there being a really long-term impact of this single event? I think we're sort of slightly disappointed on the whole that the financial crisis didn't change the world, at least, you know, not in observable. Now, in your work, you seem to observe exposure to the financial crisis as a defining moment, but it, it is an example of an interesting defining moment that may indeed have had perception effects that are long-lasting, in which case, again, the, the, the kind of cultural con convergence argument would still go, how long do we think this effect is going to last? Can there be an offsetting event that could mean we get back on a more normal? These are all interesting questions that come out of it, but not ones I have a great answer for. Thanks, Tim. So let's see if there are any questions to the online audience. You tell. Yes? Okay. Let's take a, a couple of questions to the online audience. Okay, so two questions from the online audience. So first uh, from Victor Perez asking uh, about your view about the role of media in boosting or harming trust between population and state. Uh, and the other one was from uh, Nora Arnio asking, or uh, asking any tips on how to begin building the trust when there is there isn't any. Thank you. Thanks. And there was a question, I think, from yeah, from there. Could you, yeah. Sorry. Yes. Go ahead. Yeah. Go ahead, please. It's, uh, Thank you very much for that wonderful exposition. I'm uh, Dr. Speciosa Wandida. I'm a student of David Bloom, whom I'm sure you know, Michael Reich, and uh, Alan Hill. So I'm all over the place. <laughs> because I'm no longer really an active researcher or working with any university. And uh, my question is, based on what we have been listening to for some time with, in this conference. And the fact that research is actually research and we use the past to extrapolate what may happen in the future. In your opinion, what would it take to work with the present as searchers to search now in real time for us to be able to get the solutions that are relevant in real time. Because to me, it appears that COVID has, is a watershed which is showing us that moving forward, 
we may have to do things differently. So what do you think it would take for, for searchers to do that? Thank you. Thanks. Tim. Okay, three, again, three brilliant questions. Um, very quick answers. I mean, on the, I think the role of the media is a really important issue. Um, and, um, and also the role of social media in particular and how that's changing the landscape here. Um, the, the, the answer is I don't think we have any very clean evidence on, on this. I mean, you know, there are lots of um, interesting studies of this. Um, and um, so a good example is you know, to what extent does the media get to misreport or report the misdemeanors of politicians, for example. That would be one, one big question. So one thing you do see is a, a clear array of countries in the data that have very repressed media and very high trust. Now, you can say that's because they're countries where you know, everybody is behaving well, or these are countries. So there's a lot of heterogeneity out there that needs to be, that needs to be explored. And, I don't, and again, I think it's part of the agenda. I don't think we're ever going to conclude, at least I hope we're never going to conclude, that the best way to achieve trust in politics is to repress the media. I, I would have a big problem with that, but that's, that's a longer argument. Um, I, on the question of what we know about building trust, I mean, I, I, I kind of come back a little bit to what I said in, 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 in response to an earlier question. I, I do think it's about trying to legitimize governments in situ, not to rely on external actors dictating the agenda. I, I, I feel very strongly that one of the mistakes that we made historically was thinking that the international community should be the predominant steerer of the fortunes of countries. And I think we just went too far uh, in that and legitimizing the views of the citizens and trying to build stronger and effective states. Now, of course, that, we all know that. There's nothing <laughs> controversial, I hope, in what I just said. But how you action that and the, the, the institutionalization of that, I still think is a work in, in progress. And the, and the final question, really, really interesting question, which is much bigger than my talk, and I, and I think you hinted, this is, you know, what, what do we really do and how do we make research uh, uh, into policy? Um, again, the, I think one of the, one of the issue, issues is, is to be grounded in the specific experiences of the places where you're making policy. The, I, I'm always very, I mean, Maybe it sounded like I was guilty of this from my presentation, but I wouldn't dream of taking anything I've shown you today to a country and saying there's some cross-country regression that tells me or some cross-country relationship that tells me your country needs to do X. You know, we, we do need contextually grounded. But, but one thing, and funny enough, I was chatting, and so Adnan, who's the chief economist at FCDO, so he's like in the firing line with actually translating research into policy, um, we're talking about over, over breakfast is that, you know, maybe we don't reward sufficiently the translation function of, of research. You know, the people who do research get very well rewarded by, you know, they get glamorous prizes and they get, you know, attracted to good universities. But, you know, there's a real intermediation role about how do you take research and do you translate it effectively on the ground? And you know, many of you in the room will be in that business, I know, but I'm not sure we give that sufficient reward. And how we give that reward, I don't know, but I, I would take away that that's perhaps a missing piece of the, of, of the, of the puzzle here to, to make work much more contextual. Mm -hmm. So Tony, you had a question, uh, Tony yeah. Allison, in the front. And I think I saw two questions from there, right? Yeah, okay, keep your, keep your hands up. So, uh, Tony Addison from the um, University of Copenhagen. Um, we know that inflation is uh, very effective at destabilizing societies. In fact, Lenin said, if you want to destroy capitalism, inflation is one way of, of doing it. We've now entered into what seems to be a very high inflation period. And um, you can take the example, say, of Sri Lanka at the moment, which is having great difficulties with this. But, but also, um, if you look at... Uh, uh, Yesterday, the, the governor of the Bank of England admitted that we, you know, we're having really difficulties with, um, uh, with independent central banks coping with the inflationary shock, particularly from food prices. So over the last 30 years, we've, we've built up a lot of public trust in a key institution, which is independent central banks. And uh, they've built credibility and brought down inflation that way. But we now seem to be sort of entering into an era where policymakers are saying, 
we're having great difficulty <laughs> maintaining that credibility. And in the case of Sri Lanka, they don't really quite know what to do next. So I wonder what your observations are on, as it were, this is another event, you know, COVID was an event, events come along. In the case of uh, poorer countries, those events can overwhelm government institutions, trust in government, but also in advanced economies as well. And what observations you might have on that? Thank you. Thanks, Tony. Two questions from there, I think. Yes, go ahead. Uh, so just wait for the mic to get to you. Hi, uh, Rinchan uh, Mirza from University of Kent. I'd just like to um, know your views on the historical origins of, of trust. If one looks at, for instance, the colonial experience uh, across vast swathes of, let's say, South Asia, you had this system of indirect rule whereby elites were kind of cultivated and, and preserved through different forms of colonial instruments like the Land Alienation Act or, or other forms of you know, uh, direct interven intervention within societies. And once you see that colonialism ends and you have a, enter a post-colonial phase, a lot of these institutions or you know, weak state capacity, in some areas like the frontier regions, there wasn't even a state. That you didn't have constitutional courts, you didn't have a police system. There were very different ways of controlling these areas. And in a lot of cases, those systems have pretty much been preserved with slight modifications. So my question is, without a radical restructuring of economic and political power, a clean break from the past, how do you see trust can be built up from bottom up into any state institution, and if that's even possible? Thank you. Um, Tom Dirks, University of Basel, actually had pretty much this, the same question. Um, so also wanted to ask you more about the historical uh, dimensions of, well, state formation and then indeed a reflection on, on the, the legacy of colonialism. But maybe in addition to that, if we look more recently at the uh, debacles in Iraq and Afghanistan, you see that some Western countries that are pretty high up in your graph uh, with trust in, in the state um, actually have done things that may have lowered trust in the state um, in places like Afghanistan and Iraq. And so I think we need to be honest uh, about that. Uh, yeah, what would like to hear your thoughts. Okay, so in terms of the, the last two questions, I'm going to suggest we're, we're having a re really good, you know, I, I'm not gonna be able to give brilliant answers. But that means, you know, but we're having the right conversation because I do think the right corollary of everything I said is to, and, and even Tony's question sort of speaks to this too, is, you know, what are the things we can do and what are the things we don't do, includes what we don't do, if we're going to think through the world using this lens? I think we're, we kind of, we hid a little bit behind the institutionalist agenda, um, meaning that, I mean, I think the, the independent central banks is a very good example. That was a triumph, supposedly, of the 1990s. You know, we, we can slay the problem of inflation by creating an institutional fix, and that, that did work for a, close to a generation, but even seems to be falling apart. It fell apart, I would say, I have to be a little careful because I was sitting around the table um, when, when we did the first quantitative easing exercise almost globally in the Bank of England in, 2009. Um, I, I, by the way, like everybody in the room, I didn't even know what quantitative easing was in 2008, and yet we were doing it in 2009 um, as routinely as an alternative to conventional monetary policy. Um, but the point I'm making is that you know you have to be adept in your conceptualization of what you're doing and the, in the context in which you're doing it to have any chance. I. I don't know to what extent we can realistically be far-sighted. I mean, I think you know, the interesting thing about, again, coming to Tony's question, is you know, we are dealing in the present in events that we none of us, literally none of us, I think, would have anticipated two, three years ago, you know, even if we'd been far-sighted. I think we maybe could have been realizing some of the implications of, um, of inflation a little bit earlier than, than we did because of the very loose monetary policies around the world we're having to unwind. But by and large, these are, these are events, and it's how you respond to those events that, that will define trust. I was a child of the 1970s in the sense that I, 
You know, I came of age, my impressionable years began in the 1970s, really, during a period of, in, you know, in the UK and of incredible macroeconomic turmoil. And I think, you know, my whole perception of the world was, was influenced by seeing essentially one policy failure after another. And, you know, depending on where you were brought up and when you were brought up, you might have witnessed that in your own context. But um, how you then unwind those effects um, and, and also how you re deal with the periods of stability. I mean, I, when I was um, uh, uh, on the uh, central bank, of, very briefly, um, there was this big debate about um, what was called the great stability or the great moderation, which was this period in the mid-1990s of almost no macroeconomic volatility. And there was, there were, even then, people were talking about two views. Was it good luck or good policy? And of course, what the policymakers wanted the answer to be <laughs> it was good policy. We've cracked this. This is never going to happen again. Um, so, so I think that, that, there's a, that I, I think I'm going to encourage you and you wider to, to lead the debate, perhaps have your, one of your future conferences on what we really know about trust building and its consequences, because I think all of the questions are revealing there's, there's deep-seated historical elements here, things that happened in the past that often look like defining moments, but then unwind unexpectedly. Um, um, and I, th I think there's just a huge agenda here, and I, I wish I could stand up here and I can tell you, oh, you do the following five things and, and everything works well. I think, you know, we're always, trying to use what knowledge we have, contextual knowledge we have, to try and make the best of a situation, but I don't, I don't have very easy answers um, to this. Whether, for example, just to come back to Tony's question, we are going to see a retreat from the mantra that independent central banks are the answer to everything. I mean, we, 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 we could have a situation where the politicians say, you know, th this delegation to expert bodies isn't, isn't working anymore. We're gonna cease back control. Um, I think we're a long way from that, by the way, but you never know. Um, so you, you but, but if you look at climate, so just briefly coming to climate change, which I didn't talk very much about, but it's exactly that kind of issue. Is there an institutional fix? If we only build the right set of institutions that will lead to an energy transition, we'll all be fine. Or is it something where we have to shift people's fundamental perceptions and cultural uh, preferences about what they can or cannot do in their lifestyles? That's a much scarier proposition to think that's the only way forward. But it may also be the truth, you know, that we can build all the institutions we like. What is clear, and, and I've seen quite a few people writing about this now and talking about this now, is having a bunch of scientists stand on a stage and tell us that two degrees is unacceptable is not working. It's pretty clear there's a, you know, elites, people in this room, half of you have probably got PhDs, probably more than half. Look at the, in survey data. We're all convinced about climate change. We're not the people to convince. The people to convince are the vast majority of the population who don't have PhDs, who are not convinced about climate change and think this is all about their governments finding other ways to tax them and do evil things to them. I exaggerate, but you know what I'm saying. Um, so again, is it about institutions? If we only get the institutional framework right, we get enough independent advice or independent bodies on the job, we'll fix it like we fixed inflation. It, these are big questions, and uh, you know, I'm gratified. I know that Wider is engaged in all of this, but, but the question of how we deal with, with, with climate change, particularly in fragile contexts, how we deal with trust building, particularly in fragile, all big questions. And unfortunately, I've only just raised the questions in my talk. I haven't really provided satisfactory answers, and I apologize for that. Thanks, Tim. I thought I saw questions uh, from this, yeah, from the middle. So I think I can see two hands, or maybe three. But if we keep your question very short, we can probably get through them. So go ahead, uh, right there, and then those two questions. Yes, two, uh, thank yeah. you very much. Eva Maria Egger from UN Uvida. I'm working with Patricia on the study. And one other question I had was around this difference between the level of trust and the change in trust, and whether we can think of some threshold at which the trust is sufficient for effective state capacity, and whether that's an area of research to explore. Thank you. At the back, yep. Uh, Leo P. Sachin, NYU Abu Dhabi. If I understood the implication of the argument correctly, you seem to be saying that certain societies are peaceful and prosperous for a long time. They have citizen bind because, for example, there are executive constraints or elections and they're going to have high levels of trust. And then there is going to be a shock that comes along and things might change. And I wonder if there might be an alternative path to trust 
Uh, and in that context, what about China? So we have a society that is repressive, that has experienced a great deal of conflict. And on all of these services, it's quite interesting. We have a very high level of uh, interpersonal trust. We have a high level of trust in institutions. And it appears, certainly looking at COVID, that we also have a very high level of voluntary compliance. And so is that a pathway that we're ignoring, potentially, is there a potential pathway there that's an alternative that we're ignoring because we're actually focusing on experiences that, we, that are familiar to us, on Western experiences? Thanks. Uh, one more question, just one more question. From yeah, hi, this is uh, Zachariah Mampoli at the City University of New York. Um, I think I have a question that builds on the previous one, which is I'm, I'm curious about the, the connection between repression and peace that you're drawing, because um, it seems very important to your conceptual framework. Uh, and I'm, I'm not, I can, I can go with you some way, but, uh, but I, I was struck when you showed the, the data on how you categorize what constitutes a repressive country and what's not a repressive country. Because if I think about objective measures of repression, I would imagine things like the size of the prison population, the size of the police force, the size of the military force, and of course, by that standard, you know, the U.S. would be number one in, in most of those things, but you didn't classify it as repressive, uh, whereas China comes out very poorly on those metrics. And then I can think of a lot of other cases where, you know, th this understanding of repression seems to be very important to your, to your categorizations of these three types of countries. Um, so how did you measure repression? What, what constitutes a repressive country, if not the things that I just mentioned? Tim, okay, well, I, I, I'll give short, short I, 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 love, I love that question, I mean, because I think it, it, it highlights the importance of, um, of, of, of the agenda where we, we start to, to view all forms of violence and political violence on a kind of continuum, like you're saying, where we have to think about where different countries are on that, on that spectrum. And we, I mean, it's rather arbitrary to take specific indicators. So actually, just to be honest about where we measure repression, we use specifically repression of opposition groups by incumbent governments as our measure of repression. But you quite rightly say that's a very particular measure of repression. I think the, the thing, although I sort of invited us to think about this by putting those clusters around the sets of countries, I think, I think you know, there are all forms of both violence and political violence that go on in societies which are often strategic by some group in another wanting to impose their will on others. Um, and, and they should be part of what we, we study. I mean, in the narrow sense, the thing I wanted to emphasize is that, you know, when you move from a country in, conf in open conflict to one in covert conflict because of repression, you know, we want to think of that as differently, uh, as different to a country that transitions to what you might call meaningful peace, where there's diminution of repression. But I, I think your question shows how important it is to, 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 to raise that up. And also the issue of path dependence. So, so I've spent a lot of time poring over political histories more than is good for me. Um, um, and, and, and you're completely right. We shouldn't get the, we shouldn't invite people to believe there's a sort of single path all countries would, would follow. I mean, one of the interesting things that I'll just throw out since um, uh, it's sort of a, it, my own country context fit, fits rather well is this transition out of monarchy. If you look in around Europe, there are quite a few countries that transition to democracy out of monarchy was their route to that. They do actually look rather different both constitutionally and politically than the countries that made different forms of transition, for example, post-civil conflict like Spain and Portugal. Um, so each, even within that cohesive set, there isn't a common history. So you have to be very, I mean, the, the real issue is that every country has to have its own game plan if it's gonna have any chance of doing this successfully. And we shouldn't be for one second suggesting to anyone that there's a kind of um, one size fits all, this is the path that you have to follow. We, we used to call that in the commission, the curse of Denmark. Meaning that you know everybody wants to be like Denmark. I mean, roughly speaking, uh, maybe the Finns think they're better than Denmark. I don't know, but anyway, roughly speaking, everyone wants to be like Denmark. But that's a, that's a terrible thing to want to be. Not in the sense that being Denmark isn't great, but being Denmark, looking at Denmark tells you nothing, because it's like looking at a wonderful building. You know, I'll take my favorite building, and I think that's a beautiful building. Um, but actually, I want to know where did you put the scaffolding, and what were the construction methods. And how did somebody actually come to put that elevator shaft where they put it or that beautiful corniecing or whatever? 
And looking at a finished building will tell you almost nothing about the construction methods that you use to build that building. And we should be spending more time studying the scaffolding and the uh, bricks and mortar than we do studying the final building. And that's the curse of Denmark. You know, we really need to think about how we get there. On the, on the trust change, I think it's really interesting, but one of the challenges, and I don't think we're really even close to doing this, is what are the sort of short and long-term effects? So I kind of showed you that early years experience, but one of the striking things in Britain during the, during the COVID period was how quickly some people's perceptions of trust changed over months, not even years. Now, have they shifted permanently? We had this particular episode where one of the Prime Minister's advisors who had COVID drove to a location in the north of England, completely against the rules. And I think, I haven't, I haven't sort of tried to look at this in the data, but it do, did look as if that just happened to coincide with a period where diminution in trust, did, there was a big diminution in trust. So you can provoke, it's like the phone booth experiments. I don't know if you ever saw this in that well-being literature, but it turned out if you went around and put dollar bills in phone booths and then surveyed people's life satisfaction depending on whether they happen to go into a, into a phone booth with a dollar bill, which they would then put in their pocket and walk out. And then they would tell you their life goes really, really well for like one hour or something. I just discovered a dollar bill in a phone booth. You have to be really careful. Are we looking at very short-term effects where you can provoke an immediate psychological response? And what are the more deep-seated, long-lived changes that are very hard to reverse? And I, I, I personally don't think we're even close to being able to map out what is the permanent, semi-permanent, temporary changes. Uh, thanks, Tim. We've got to bring this keynote lecture to a close. I mean, in a way, what I think two things I feel I took away from your lecture and also the question of the audience. One is that given that trust in institutions is part dependent, historical conditions, what are the trigger points that shift you from low trust to high state trust in, in state institutions equilibrium? So how do you switch countries from that and what kind of policies can do that? And I think that's a really important question. The other important question is the COVID-19 example. If states can use coercive cap capacities to control the pandemic, why should they incentivize, why, why, why should they be interested in voluntary compliance? So then this trade-off between co coercive state capacity and voluntary compliance, and exactly what's the balance in that? And I think that's also an important question, especially in many societies we have authoritarian systems. So let me, let's bring this lecture to a close. We're going to have coffee, and we have some very interesting fireside chats, I think some of which are happening in this room. So let's take a break. We'll come back at 11.30. Thanks.